Welcome to living the new life. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Praise the Lord. I just want us to take this worship song. This morning is going to be a turning point for some people. I don't know if everybody's going to key into what God is going to do this morning. But I'm certain that if you can worship Him, ah, if you can open your hearts and see Him as He is, the God that is over your needs, the God that knows the end before the beginning, you're going to worship Him. You're going to worship Him. Let's take this song. I want you to keep away that heart in your heart right now. Just keep it aside. God is going to deal with it. Keep it aside. You are God from beginning to the end. There's no place for argument. You are God all by your Come on, let us sing it. Please, can you help me with the keyboard? There's no place for argument. You are God all by your. Oh, you are God, say you are God. He is God. From beginning to the end, there's no place for argument. There's no place. You are God all by yourself. Oh, you are God. Say you are God. I want to hear your voice. Sing it out. Sing it loud and clear. That song. Acknowledges the awesomeness of God. Oh, you are God. From beginning to the end, there's no place for argument. You are God. And so, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for a time like this. We give all the praise and the glory to you for what you have started in our midst, even before this morning. Thank you for what you're set to do in our respective lives. Thank you for where you are taking us. Thank you because you are God all by yourself. Heavenly Father, I yield myself as a vessel in your hands. I humble myself that you alone may be exalted in this place. I want you, Lord, to take the stage and do among your people only what God alone is known to be able to do. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Where is the keyboardist? Has he gone home? Where did he go to? God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. I am a very I like participation when I'm preaching. So I would like for you to follow me carefully. And if you have, I heard the pastor last week was asking us to get our writing materials. It is always, always very necessary that when you come into a place like this, you come with something to write. Whenever I'm going for a ministration, or I'm just invited to a program. I try to go with a pen and a paper. You must definitely hear something. 
you must hear something. And when you hear something, you write something. And when you write something, you won't forget something. And when you don't forget something, your life will definitely become something. Something more than you can ever imagine. You heard that? You heard that? Praise the Lord. Today, I want to be sharing something very briefly with you. There was a certain woman in the book of John chapter 4. The story opens with Jesus being tired and hungry. He was thirsty, he was hungry, he was tired. And then he found himself beside a well. He had sent his disciples away into the village that was nearby to go and get food. As the disciples went, there was a woman that came to that well to draw water. We are told in the story in John chapter 4 that the woman was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked her, give me water to drink. And the woman said, how is it that you, being a Jew, will ask me, a Samaritan, for water? Praise God. Listen to me. Something happened in that woman's life that day that changed her life forever. What was it? This woman was notorious for having five husbands before that day. She was a woman of dubious and doubtful persuasion. The Bible says it was about the sixth hour of the day, talking about 12 in the afternoon. She came to the well to fetch water. And then she encountered Jesus. When Jesus began to say, give me water, the woman thought it was a lie. You know, when men want to initiate a discussion with somebody they want to toast. So that's what must have gone on in her mind. She must have felt that this is another man. And she prepared herself. She raised her defenses. If you are coming to toast me, it's not going to work. Because I've had five men already. And there is another one that I have, that I'm living with now, who is not my husband. So she had prepared not to give Jesus a chance in her life. The Bible says, Jesus said to her, you have had five husbands, five men in your life. And the one you're living with now, the sixth, is not even your husband. That was where Jesus caught her attention. And then the woman sat back and then began to listen to him. At the end of the day, the Bible says she ran into the village and went and told them, come, and see a man. I don't know what must have gone on in the minds of the people that were listening to her. Because here was a woman who was notorious. They know some people even hid their husbands away from her. Five men have gone in through her. Men have used her, but God had never used her. She had the expertise to tell people who men were, but she never knew who God was. 
She was an expert. She had a degree. She had a reputation with men, but not with God. Hello. What happened to that woman is what I'm here to discuss with you this morning. What happened to that woman is a phenomenon in the Christian faith known as serendipity. Listen to me. What did I say? Seren what? Dipity. What is serendipity? Serendipity is, let me give you the dictionary before we go to the scriptural meaning. Is an unexpected occurrence or development of events in a happy or beneficial way. Something you were not looking for. Something you did not set out to pursue. You were not praying about it. You were not desiring it. It's beyond your expectation. But then it happened and it became beneficial to you. That is serendipity. It's an English word. Hear me, people of God. Sometimes, and many times, the best blessings of God are the ones that come through serendipity. If God was limited to answering all of your prayers, you'll be more miserable than you are. If God was limited or restricted to paying attention to only your expectation, Christianity would not be a supernatural affair. But you know what God does? Sometimes what you are not looking for begins to come after you. And I pray for you that serendipity will happen for you this year in the name of Jesus. This week, you will experience the God of serendipity. She did not go out to look for another man. She went to fetch water. And then she came back with a Messiah. Are you listening to me? She was not looking for any reputation. She was not looking for how to clear a bad image in the society. But when Jesus was done with her, the woman became a foremost evangelist in her community. That city received Jesus because of her testimony. I give you another example. Moses and the burning bush. Moses was 40 years old when he began to consider delivering the children of Israel. He looked at it. He saw their suffering. He remembered his roots. I am a Jew. And look at what they are doing to my people. And he attempted once or twice to deliver their, his people from the hardship that Pharaoh had subjected them to. He failed. His life was in, in danger. Moses ran into the wilderness. And Moses stayed in the wilderness for 40 years with his father-in-law. A prince suddenly became a headsman. And you get what I'm saying? That was reduction in life. He had given up on that ambition. He had given up on that pursuit. He had given up on that mission in life. He had closed that chapter. Perhaps he had even forgotten about his parents and about his sisters and about everybody in the land of Egypt. Yet he was trapped in the harsh wilderness. And then, God showed up in a burning bush. And the rest is history. Moses was not looking for God. Moses was not desiring that encounter. He was not planning to meet with God in that place. But God showed up in his life. And Moses became a household name both in the Old Testament and even now. That is serendipity. I give you another instance of serendipity. A woman by the name 
Ruth. Now let's turn the Bible now to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth, chapter 2. Are you there? You know the story of Ruth. How that Ruth had lost her husband when they were in the land of Moab. And then Naomi decided that she was returning home back to Israel. And then Ruth decided that she was going to follow her. And then they ended up in Israel. But now, there was no food. There was nothing. Naomi had nothing to offer Ruth. But Ruth had sworn that wherever you go, I will go. He said, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. She had determined that this woman, I will follow her to the end. That something was about to happen in her life that is also about to happen to you too. She was not looking or thinking about a husband again. Ruth was not looking for a relationship. She just told her mother-in-law, he said, allow me, look at the poverty in the house. There's no food, there's nothing. Allow me to go and glean in the fields of wherever I find today. And then whatever I bring back, we can sustain on that. She was just looking for a sustainer. She was just looking for an avenue to subsist on whatever she got from the fields. And then she went to the field. And the Bible says, when she got to the field, the drama unfolds how she met with a man called Boaz. Boaz ended up marrying Ruth. Ruth the Moabites became one of the grandparents of Jesse, of David, and also of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you can see that. I'm not sure you're understanding what is happening here. The day she went to that field, she didn't go there to seduce Boaz. She didn't even mind who was the owner of that field. She was just there to pick grains and go back home. But in the place where she went to pick grains, destiny found her. And she became, look, there is no how you can write the history of Jesus and not mention that woman's name. Isn't that interesting? A Moabitess, a nation that was considered an enemy of God's people. Somebody in Jesus' lineage came from that same nation. That is serendipity. Praise God. I give you another example. In the book of First Samuel chapter 9, there was a certain man named Saul. How did Saul become the king of Israel? The Bible says that Saul, one day the father got up and said, Saul, take one of the servants and go and look for the lost asses. In 1 Samuel chapter 9 from verse 1 down to the end up to chapter 10, you'll find the story there. And then they went. They went through all the places that they could Imagine, went through the Mount of Ephraim, went through the whole land of Benjamin. They did not find what they were looking for. And listen very carefully to me. The Bible says that when they had given up hope and they were about to turn and go back home, the servant who was with Saul said to Saul, there is a man in this city. If we can locate that man, he will tell us where the lost asses are. I don't know where you are in your life today. Is there something that is missing in your life? Is there something that is broken? Is there something that you have not been able to attain onto? Is there something that has given you sleepless nights? The God of serendipity will find you. 
the God that orchestrates serendipity, he will find you in the name of Jesus. And so Saul followed the servants. To cut the long story short, they met with Samuel. And then Saul was anointed and he became the king of Israel. Was he in any political party? Was he praying about it? Did he plan that journey? Did somebody inform Samuel that something is about to get missing? Was all of those drama like that? No. He never had the slightest idea that something bigger than the asses was about to find him. He was looking for an ass and God was looking for a king. And then Saul and God intercepted somewhere. Serendipity is that interception. Serendipity is an act and a dimension of God's grace. It's a dimension of God's grace. God is not limited to your prayers. Some of you think and pastors have erroneously taught you that if you don't expect anything that God can do nothing. They even go to the point of saying that you need to give God permission to work in your life. My friend, there is a dimension of God that is called sovereignty. That dimension has nothing to do with you. Hello, listen to me. Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda. He met a multitude of invalid people. There was one man who had been in that condition for 38 years. He was paralyzed and very useless to himself. Jesus walked up to him and said, Do you want to be made whole? The man began to say stories. What happened? Jesus just simply said, Rise up, take your bed, and walk. Hello, listen to me. Where was the prayer point of that man? I want you to see that you have limited God for too long in your life. That is why you have not experienced a dimension of this mercy, a dimension of this grace. If God was limited to only our prayers, I am certain we will not be here today. There are things that you have in your life today that are not traceable to your connections, they are not traceable to your qualifications, they are not traceable to your abilities. They came to you when you were not expecting it. The best of God's blessings come when you are not looking. The man did not know that the one that was asking him that question was able to take him away from that place. Imagine him. He was trapped among invalid and impotent people. I don't know where you are located today in life. You could be in a community of invalids. Maybe your life is not ticking. Maybe your journey has been truncated. Maybe you are suffering some form of depression and frustration because of certain things that you have asked God for that you have not seen in your life. Hello, can you take, can you take, can you take, can you take a pause and understand that God is not limited to what you ask him to do. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 78 verse 41 that they limited the Holy One of Israel. You can limit God. You can limit God. When you think that it's only your prayer, some people have fasted and fasted and fasted and fasted and fasted and nothing has happened. Some people have gone to mountains, men of God, they have poured oil and up to the point that they even, they even collected granite oil on their head. And still nothing happened. Why? Because when God sees that you are beginning to think that it is your efforts, it is your righteousness. Some people, I met a woman one day and she said, 
she was trying to complain to me. She said, I, I was in a ministry, a very renowned ministry, big pastor. And then I used to pay my first fruits. I used to pay my tax. I used to do this. I used to do that. And I discovered that nothing came back in return. <laughs> she said, I, I paid tithe. I paid first fruits. I paid this one. I paid that one. She said, and I did not get anything. Look at me. Last week, I had to go and meet my neighbor to give me a tuba of yam because I was hungry. But meanwhile, I have dropped my tithe and my off my, my first fruits in this church. And throughout that year, I did not see one penny. Let me tell you something. Sometimes it is not the devil attacking you. Sometimes God can suspend those things you call your efforts to prove to you where was your tithe and your offering when you were sleeping? What woke you up this morning? When you were traveling on those dangerous routes, how many titan offerings did you pay to get to your destination? When God sees that your mindset is connected to those things, it can suspend them. It can suspend the efficacy. Listen to me. God can suspend the efficacy of any principle that even himself ordained to prove a point to you. And I told her that day, I said, perhaps it is because you think that God is, God owes you to bless you. He doesn't owe you to bless you. He is a God of principles, yes. But then, he doesn't want you to think that your efforts have brought you thus far. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's see another example. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 64 from verse 1 to 4. Isaiah 64 verse 1 to 4. Let me read this one for you. Isaiah 64 1 to 4. It says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. He says, now look at verse 3. He says, when thou these terrible things, which we do what? Are you following me? Isaiah 64 verse 3. Read that out. When thou did what? Terrible things, which we do what? Which we looked not for. Thou did terrible things, which we were not looking for. Did you see it? God can do things you are not looking for. He can navigate you to places that you were not planning to go. He can surprise you with packages that you have not worked for. I want your mentality to change today. When you have this consciousness within you, you will exclude anxiety. You will not fear. This is why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, it says, that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God is up and about your life. Don't despair. You are not alone in this world. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why are you desperate for things? Why are you running helter skelter? Some people are so desperate until they landed themselves in the hands of the occult. Some people are so desperate that they have made a mess of their lives and they are not able to recover. Why? 
are you in a competition when God is up and about your life? Do you think that he doesn't know where you are now? God knows your address. He knows where you are living. He knows that there is a bill called your rent to pay. He knows that your children must go to school. Did Jesus not say this to the, to the people that were listening to him? He said, which among you, with all your thoughts and your worries and your calculations, can add a cubit to his life? You are taking thought. What, what, what am I going to wear? Some people are not in church today because they don't have clothes to wear, according to them. It's not like they don't have clothes, but the clothes are not beautiful enough. These are the things that are killing Christians and are driving people crazy. You look at a friend and then she tells you, you see this bag? I bought it for 750000 <laughs> And then from that day, your peace disappears. Somebody's using house rent to buy bag and you are killing yourself. See, I'm not telling you something that I've not known. My wife is here. The person, there was, there's a lady now in this city. Her bags are in that range. She cannot wear, she cannot carry a bag of 10,000 naira. No. There was a time she bought a handbag. And then the price was 750,000 naira. You can't believe this. But she knows what I'm talking about. It is somebody's salary for a year. You are carrying it about and you are expecting armed robbers not to locate you. What? That is a house. Have you seen somebody carrying a house on his head before? But this woman has been carrying a house. Everywhere she went, she was holding a house. So thieves that do not have places to stay would definitely come and take the house because they are homeless. You put your life in disarray. Because you are competing, you are not in any competition with anybody. You came here on your own. This life is a singular race. That is why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it says, let us run the race that is set before us. There is a race. That one is your own. I have my own. My wife has. No matter how much I love her, I can't run for her. And when the day is over, and then we are standing in the presence of God. God is not going to ask us. He's going to ask me and he's going to ask her. So why are you killing yourself? When you understand that God is a God of serendipity, that what you are passing through is an ingredient in his hand for him to prepare that dish that will mesmerize you at the end of the day. You will calm down. Listen, every of your circumstance is part of the story. There is nothing that is outside the plan for a child of God. Nothing. I don't care if last week there was no money in your bank account and then this week you didn't have money to pay your way to church. I don't care whatever has happened to you. It doesn't matter. It is working out for your own I said it's working out for your own good. I said it's working out for your own good. It is working out for your own good. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. It says to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above what you ask or imagine. That is the class where God is. God is in that dimension where he can mesmerize you beyond your widest imagination. That is who your father is. Child of God, relax. Come on, say to somebody, relax. Say to somebody, relax. You are too tense. Relax. God is working out something. I love that song. God is able to do just what he says he will do. Don't give up on God. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Don't let what you are hearing about what is happening in the nation today confused you. God has not lost his focus of you. I want to round up with this. Psalm 37.
Psalm 37. I want us to open to Psalm 37. Don't you give up on God because God will not give up on you. Are you there? Who has a translation that is different from James? Yeah. Who has a translation that is different from King James? Who has a translation? Good news. Okay. Can I hear Psalm 37 verse 1? Okay. To not be worried on account of the wicked. Praise God. Now let's look at verse 23. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Verse 24. Do he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholded him with his hand. Verse 25. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread. God will not forsake you. Amen. I said, God will not forsake you. Amen. Child of God, God will not forsake you. Amen. God will not forsake you. Amen. Don't give up on God. Because God is not going to give up on you. Don't change your creed. Don't run away from the faith because of what you're passing through. I have seen people that have left Christianity and they have run into Islam and other religions because they could not understand that what was happening in their lives was a part of the ingredients that God needed to orchestrate something good in their lives. Listen to me. For the women that are here, you know that when you want to cook, your soup. You gather different kinds of ingredients. Some of those ingredients, if you taste them in their raw form, singularly like that, they are very unpleasant. Is that correct? They are very unpleasant. Some of you cannot eat ginger just like that. Some cannot take garlic just like that. And so many other things. But you see, all of those ingredients have a part they are going to play in your pot of soup. You bring them together and you put them in one pot. And at the end of the day, when you set the dish, somebody's doing that. Mm, uh, that is what God is about to do. Amen. Those things you are passing through, they are those ingredients. Amen. Ah, very soon somebody's going to look at you. Mm, life is sweet. Your life is sweet. Amen. Oh my God, I said your life is sweet. Amen. Let us stand on our feet. Please, I need a keyboard. I don't want you to fret yourself about circumstances around you. You are in the right place. The right things are happening to you right now. It's not the devil. Sometimes God pushes you into tight corners just because he wants to express his power in your life. Hello, children of God. Do you remember when they came out from the land of Egypt? Do you know that the children of Israel did not have the slightest idea that Pharaoh was still going to chase them even after they came out? And then, instead of God leading these people to where they will escape from Pharaoh, he asked them to go by the corner of a place they call Migdor. He put them in a tight corner. If you read Exodus chapter 14 verse 2, you will see where God said that, I am going to give Pharaoh the impression that the children of Israel are entangled. Your position right now may be unpleasant to you. But God is arranging it so that your enemies will think you are finished. They 
chased after them. They said they have been trapped by the sea. The sea was behind them. They couldn't cross. There was no way that it was not the devil that led them there. It was God who led them to that tight corner. He said, I am the one leading you into this tight corner so that I can prove to Pharaoh that I am God. What is it that you're going through now? <laughs> it's a part of the book. There is a book. Every chapter is necessary. There is a book. Every page is necessary. It doesn't matter what people have said about you before now. Relax. It's all part of what the master is doing to bring the glory out of your life. Don't give up on God Cause he won't give up on you He's able of serendipity he's not waiting for your prayer points he's not waiting for your fasting he's not waiting for all of those things they are good they are necessary but god is not limited to those things he would do for you what you can do for yourself i am a product of serendipity many of the things that i enjoy today in my life came when i was not even expecting them don't let anybody lie to you God does not need your permission to do certain things in your life. Are you listening to me? He doesn't need it. Jesus said, your heavenly father knows what you need, even before you ask. He doesn't need your permission. 
he can do things in his sovereignty and this is what he's going to do for you I want you to lift up your right hand this morning I want you to begin to thank God for who he is in your life I want you to thank God thank him Maybe the devil has confused you before now that it is finished. It is over. God is not going to do anything for you. But that is a lie. That's a lie. It's a lie. Lie from the pit of hell. Hey, you will move in your life again. You will move. Daughter, don't try. Brother, don't try. God will move in your life again. He will do in your life what you cannot do for yourself. He will bring people in your way that you never thought was possible. There is a connection that you did not plan. The God is going to make it happen. There is, there is a place where God is taking you to. You did not set out for where you were going. The God is going to order your steps. You will find a order in your steps. He will take you to the right. He may take you to the left. Whatever he needs to do, God will come out true for you. Oh, don't you weep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see God move in your life again. I see God turn your life around. He's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. Shipping. So Listen to me. I have a word for someone from the Lord this morning. This week, certain events are going to unfold in your life. Mm. Listen, people of God. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying. Certain events are going to unfold in your life. 
that are not your own making. It is not your phone call. It is not your talking to somebody about them. Some things are going to unfold. It's going to be like, what is happening? And then, bam! That which you have been looking for. That you did not think possible. You have shut the door of your mind to expectations. You are not even thinking that it's going to happen. That God is going to put it in your hands. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel so strongly in my spirit to make this pronouncement to you. Because God is up and about your matter. <laughs> he is never weary. He doesn't get tired of you. Sometimes you look at yourself and you said, I don't deserve God's mercy. I don't deserve the least of his mercies. Shut up. Jesus died for you. His blood is still speaking for you. You don't know who you are. The Bible says, eyes have not seen. Neither has it entered into the hearts of any man. Ears have not heard what God is about to do in the lives of those that love him. Don't give up on God. I don't know who you are. Don't throw in the towel. No. The process has started. Every part of this process is important. Allow God to finish his work. Don't be upset. I know weeping may endure for a night. But joy will come in the morning. I want to round up with this song. There's no need to worry about what a night is going to bring. It will be all over in the morning. Ah, there's no need to worry what a night is gonna bring. I wanna tell you it will be all over in the morning. Father, 
I ask that you orchestrate in the mind of your children what they were not looking for, what they did not pray for, what they have not labored for. Father, Lord, do it in their lives that they may know that you are the God of serendipity. You are the God that is not limited to our prayers because you can do more than we can ever ask or think according to your power that is at work in us. Father, Lord, I give you the praise. I thank you for what you have already started. I thank you, Father. To you be the glory, to you be the honor. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Come on, give Jesus a hand of applause. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Park, Laduke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.